Anonymous asked a question. What are the best criticisms of the idea of trade deficits being a problem? The important thing with this issue is to understand conceptually basic economics. What money is, what a trade is, what a trade deficit is, etc. And if you just like have a conceptual model of what's going on and what we're talking about, um, then the issue is pretty easy to figure out. Most people who talk about this don't seem to actually know what they mean. Like they don't know what is going on or what they're talking about. So a trade deficit means that your country buys more stuff than it sells. So for example, we'll say that the US buys more stuff from China than we sell to China. That means we get more goods from China and China gets more money from us. So there's a flow of more goods come from China to us than vice versa, and more money goes from us to China than vice versa. So in that case, what happens? First of all, every individual trade is done because the people think it's beneficial. So just looking at it in terms of each individual trade, it should be good overall because every individual trade was good. Each business buys or sells something when it's going to help them. So in every single trade with China, but with, with one party being American and one party being Chinese, the American party is only making that trade, whether it's buying or selling, if they think it's improving their business, if it's helping their company, or if they're an individual, if it's improving their life. You know, so if every single individual trade with China is good for an American or an American business, then all of them together should also be good regardless of whether there's a deficit or a surplus uh, in total trade, meaning more buying or more selling. Okay, and second of all, so there's a trade deficit. That means more goods come into America and more money goes into China. So America has less money and more goods. What does that mean? It means there's more stuff per person. We're richer, we're wealthier in terms of actual useful stuff. We have more microwaves and computers and iPhones and stuff like that per person. Um, our quality of life, our standard of life is higher. Um, China is working for us. They're building stuff and then we get it. We get to benefit from it. So that's good for us. That's not bad for us so far. So maybe we'll find a bad part when we finish the rest of the analysis, but so far that's good for us. We have more stuff. They're sending us goods. We're buying goods. That means we get goods. Um, and you can consider, like, I have a trade deficit with Walmart. I've never sold something to Walmart in my life. Um, I've only bought things from them. The flow is entirely Walmart gives me, like, food and stuff, and I give them money. That is not bad for me. It does not hurt me. And my anyone who's ever employed me um, has a trade deficit with me because they buy my work from me and I don't buy anything from them. So trade deficit. So they shouldn't hire me? Question mark. No one should ever hire anyone for fear of a trade deficit. Okay, so trade deficit means we have more goods and less money. So what happens to prices? Less money means prices go down. There's less money for the amount of stuff. So the basic way prices work is you take all the stuff and then you take all the money and you divide stuff by money. So like the more money there is, wait, did I just flip that around? This, this kind of thing, it's like, it's not that complicated, but it's easier if you're writing it down or it's like doing math on stream. Okay. So the money has to bid for goods. So like if there's 10 pizzas and a hundred dollars, then it's going to be ten dollars per pizza and then if you have more pizzas the price goes down if you have fewer pizzas the price goes up you're dividing okay so it's money divided by stuff it's like a hundred dollars divided by 10 pizzas or a hundred dollars divided by 20 pizzas so that makes the answers come out and make sense. If it's $100 divided by 20 pizzas, then it's $5 per pizza. 
So the money supply buys all the goods. Is That's not an exact model, but it's, it's roughly uh, the right way to think about it. It's close enough for this kind of purpose. Anyway, if there's more money, it raises prices because the ratio of goods to money gets skewed more towards money. You know, if there's the same amount of 10 pizzas and then there's more money to be spent on pizza, then the price goes up because there's more dollars buying the same amount of pizza, so there's more dollars per pizza. So when our country has less money, that means prices go down. There's less dollars to be bid for things. So prices going down is uh, generally a good thing. It means people who saved money are going to come out ahead. What about people with jobs? How do the prices compare to... Um, okay, so the price of goods go down and the price of labor also goes down because money supply goes down. So to a first approximation, people make less money, but goods cost less, so they come out equal. You know, their wages go down 10%, but the price of the things they buy goes down 10%, so it doesn't matter. That's what a lower money supply does. However, what we're talking about with a trade deficit is the supply of money goes down and the supply of good go goods goes up. So the, the price of goods goes down twice. It's going down because there's less money to spend on goods, and it's going down because there's more goods. So the price of the stuff people buy is going down in two ways, but their wages are only going down in one way. Their wages go down because the money supply goes down, but importing goods, bringing in goods into the country doesn't change their wages. So their wages will go down one increment, and the prices will go down two increments, so people will be able to buy more money, buy more stuff with their paycheck. So trade deficit means people who saved money are able to buy more stuff with it because there's less money. And people who work can buy more stuff because prices go down more than their wages go down. And it means that people have a higher standard of living because more stuff is coming into the country than going out of the country. So there's more stuff to improve our lives, like bricks and steel and desks and toasters and whatever else improves people's lives. Because what, what do we buy from China? Um, what do we trade for? It's either, basically it's either consumers' goods, things that improve people's lives, like microwaves, or it is... Uh, what you could call business goods, like goods that are going to be used by a business. Like a business buys a material like steel or concrete, and then they use it to do something that helps people like build a pool or make an oven. So it all kind of ends up as things that help people or things that help business, and then business at some point helps people. So where's the bad part about trade deficits? Well, what people are worried about is something like they have our money. Okay, so what does that mean? If they have a bunch of our money, well, what can they do with it? They have two choices. They can keep it and like hoard it and hold on to it, or they can spend it. Those are their choices. Well, and if they keep it, they can invest it. So we'll call it three choices, like hoarding, investing, and spending. So what happens if we have a trade deficit, so China gets a bunch of dollars, and then they spend the dollars and they buy stuff? Uh, well, there's two choices. Either they spend the dollars outside of our country, so it doesn't really have much to do with us. So it's actually kind of the same as hoarding, because the dollars just stay outside of our country. Or they buy stuff from us. Okay, so there was a trade deficit, they got our dollars, and then they buy stuff from us. So that undoes the trade deficit. The, the dollars come back into our country, and stuff goes out of our country, and the overall effect is we bought stuff from them, and then they bought stuff from us, so it's fine. You know, the dollars came back and now we're even because they got some stuff too. So it's harmless. You know, if, if they end up just spending the dollars in our country and the dollars come back in, what's the problem? There's no problem. So what if they hoard the money? What if they just keep it? Or what if they burned it? You know, that's kind of the same as hoarding it. Like if you put it under your mattress and just never spend it, the effect while you're doing that is the same as if you just didn't have it, if you burned it or something. Well, in that case... We spent our paper dollars on stuff, and then they never spent the dollars to get stuff from us. So we got stuff, and they never got stuff. They're just hoarding the money. Like, what good is the money doing them if it's hoarded? It doesn't do anything. 
It's not like we don't have enough money in our country. We're not going to like run out of money and be unable to have an economy. It's not like we're going to have like no cash left and then you can't go to the store and buy stuff. Even without credit cards, like that wouldn't happen. We could just, um, prices would just go down so that the supply of money was adequate. Like, you know, if we have half the number of dollars in the country in terms of real physical money and we need them for buying stuff at the store, then everyone walking into a store is going to have like half as much money in their wallet. So the stores will just have all their prices and then there will be enough cash to buy things. So if, if they trade us microwaves for money and then they keep the money, there's no downside for us. Because money is basically a promise that you can get stuff later. Money is a trade good. Like the point of money is you're going to buy something with it. You're going to trade it for something later. So either they keep it and it's like we traded for stuff and then they never traded for our stuff back. Well, that's fine. We got stuff and they didn't. Or they do trade it back, in which case the deficit goes away. If people understood this stuff with like, you know, deficits with Walmart or something, you know, it doesn't have to be a foreign country. I have a trade deficit with Walmart and it totally doesn't matter. That would kind of answer the question. Anyway, so the other case is what if they invest the money? What if, what if they got all our dollars and then they invest them? So what are they going to do? They're going to invest them in a U.S. company or a Chinese company? Like if they get the dollars and then they invest them in a Chinese company and the Chinese company like buys Chinese products with them, um, then what's going on? The money supply in China has gone up, so prices go up. So they brought in more money and now they have higher prices proportional to the money they brought in. Uh, it's not helping them. So we got stuff and they got higher prices. Who cares? So what if they invested in U.S. companies? Well, then the money's flowing back into our country. So again, who cares? What if they charge us interest? What if they like loan the money to Americans at interest? Well, Americans only borrow money when they think it's in their benefit to do so. They're only going to be borrowing money at interest when that's going to help them and improve their lives. So that's First, the trade was a benefit, you know, we bought microwaves, and then also um, receiving loans was a benefit. Someone wanted that loan at that interest rate and thought that would improve their life or their business, so that's why they did the deal. So there's no downsides anywhere. And of course there are no downsides because everything going on here is voluntary, and in each thing, everyone involved thinks it's good for them, that's why they're doing it. So there's this sort of view that the people who like have all the money have all the power and then they can like loan it out and get interest without working. And it's just wrong. Um, the reason there's interest on money is that money now is more valuable than money later. Like you'd rather have $100 now than $100 in a year. It's called time preference. You know, improving your life now is better than improving it later. Having the money now is better than later. Even, even if now is not the right time to buy something, having money now gives you more flexibility. You can buy now or later. Whereas if you have it later, you can only buy later. You have fewer choices. So, so when people lend money out at interest, that's not normally, by default, that doesn't make profit for them. It's not making them better off. It's making them equally well off. Because the interest rate corresponds to the value of the delay in using the money. They're delaying buying something. They're delaying having a house or a car or whatever. Um, and the interest rate makes up for that. So it evens it out. If you're dealing with like a credit card, the reason they charge higher interest rates than that is because they consider it risky. Some people don't pay back their credit card debt. So they're charging extra for the to make up for the concern that you won't pay them back because some people don't. So if you are one of the people who pays back your credit card, then the interest rate isn't a great deal because it has priced in other people not paying back their credit cards. However, credit cards are still useful even for debt purposes because it can be hard to prove that you're not a credit risk. Like it's hard to prove to people that you're one of the people who will pay back their debt. So credit cards give you the opportunity to borrow money if you need to, 
even without having a good way to prove that you're good for it. So that is the, the value on offer from credit cards that makes it an okay deal in some circumstances to carry uh, debt on them rather than just always pay it off every month and use it just for transaction purposes rather than as actual credit. Anyway, the trade deficit thing, like I could Google and try to find like their arguments, I guess. Let's try that. All right, I'm gonna type like why trade deficits are bad into Google. Why trade deficits matter, the Atlantic. Taking the understanding deficit out of trade deficits, Forbes. Is Trump correct about trade deficits being bad for the economy, Bloomberg? Okay, some of these are pro-trade deficit, but the first one, the first one from the Atlantic just says that they matter. Okay, well, this one brings up jobs moving overseas, but jobs moving overseas is a different thing than a trade deficit. A trade deficit means we buy things from China. It doesn't mean... Okay, so they think that us buying things from China means there's more jobs in China, but that is completely wrong. The availability of jobs is not based on like demand. There, There's never like, you can't have a job because demand is too low. That's a misconception. There's unlimited demand um, for goods and services. Like the way Riesman explains this is no matter what happens, there's only going to be on average one person's labor to satisfy the desires of each person. No matter how many people are in the world, there's only one person to do the work to make a good life per person on average. So there's always going to be like, I wish I had more help and more stuff to make my life better because I only have my own labor on average. And, you know, some people get more than that. They get to hire like a maid or a nanny to help them. But then other people have less like the maid spends part of their time helping someone else's family and part of the time helping their own family. So the average, but the average has to be one person per person. That's how much labor is available to help make people's lives good. So there's no shortage of demand for ways to pay, make people's lives better. Because there's certainly, I would like to have a cook and a maid and whatever, um, if it was cheap enough, you know? If it was free, I'd certainly take them. So my demand for additional things to improve my life includes a bunch of stuff I don't have. And the only reason I don't have it is the price is too high. Like I, I prioritize buying other things. And it's the same for pretty much everyone. Um, if they had more money or if prices were lower, they could think of more things that they want, more things to buy. So buying things from China does not mean there's insufficient demand for U.S. stuff. If the U.S. produced more stuff that was of value to people, then people would want it. Like, there's no shortage of desire for more stuff and better stuff and more services and better services. What happens if people in the U.S. produced more is the, basically the amount of money stays the same and then the amount of goods and services goes up. So there's the ratio changes. So stuff gets cheaper because there's more stuff per dollar in existence. So if... At any time, more people in the U.S. could start more businesses or expand business or, or whatever and produce more stuff. And what would happen is prices would go down for all stuff and they would be able to sell their stuff. And would they be better off given that prices have gone down now? And so they're selling stuff at like a lower price. And the answer is yes, because they can also buy stuff at a lower price. So prices going down is harmless because the prices go down equally for them as a seller and as a buyer. So the, the change in prices is harmless. However, also, now there are more people selling more stuff. So that's good. They are able to have a business and sell stuff. And of course people would buy it because if the total spending buys more stuff, people would be happy. 
they'd have more stuff. So the basic thing is if people produce more, then everyone will have more on average. There's no downside. Like, and there's no, it's not like people have too much stuff and they wouldn't like more. That doesn't make sense. If people were more productive and created twice as much stuff, then we'd all just like be twice as wealthy. We would have uh, twice as much uh, like, it's not like we'd buy twice as much food or twice as many computers, but so, cause we don't need more of them. Like, you know, you only eat so much food. You only need like one microwave say. So instead of buying a second microwave, what happens if the price of microwaves goes in half is, um, microwaves will be half as much of your budget. Like they used to be 2% of your budget was microwaves and now 1% of your budget is microwaves which means that you can buy more of something else that you'd like more of. Something where you'd be happy to have double or triple of it, like chess lessons. Maybe you want to learn to be a good chess player faster, so you buy more lessons now that you have some money available. If you find any of this hard to follow, um, what you should do is read about economics, learn economics. Um, I recommend the book Capitalism, a Treatise on Economics by George Riesman, available at his website, capitalism.net, and also available on Amazon. If you find that too hard, um, you could try some of his short Kindle books, or go to Mises.org and read some of their articles, or try Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. If that's also too hard, um, you could ask another question and say what some of the difficulties you're, you're having with learning economics are. And that applies to anyone, not just whoever asked this question. And as far as Trump and trade deficits and stuff, um, I have a blog post about this. The blog post is called Donald Trump is a Protectionist, and it quotes the economist Bastiat from 1845, who explains why Trump's positions on trade are really, really dumb and economically illiterate. And of course, it's not just Trump. I think um, the majority of political commentators just don't know basic economics. So I will link the, uh, the Trump thing and capitalism.net in the show notes.